Welcome, friends, to another exciting show of the Grace Hour. We've uh, been talking about marriage all week. In fact, we started last weekend with the Marriage Getaway Seminar. We've been rolling through the week on this topic of marriage, which is a great topic to talk about, especially for the Church of God, because the way that the Church and God sees marriage is completely different from what's being promoted and taught in our culture and in our society today. Um, Thank you for tuning in. We're pretty much a daily program that dives into believers' daily challenges, specifically today in marriage, and helping them learn how to operate in faith in a practical way. I'm Pastor Ronaldo Brown, and I'm in the studio with Pastor Jason Moore, and we're talking about, as I said, marriage. You can reach out to us, and this is a great program Friday. It's a great program to reach out to us and let us know your thoughts about today's theme of marriage at 1-800-338-7060 or at 410-LOCALLY-483-3700. You can email questions at questions at gracehour.org. You can also let us know what you think of the new format of the show. We'd love to hear feedback about what you think. There have been a lot of changes to the Grace Hour. We'd love to hear from you. You can email those comments and thoughts at questions at gracehour.org. You can also check us out on all kinds of podcasts from Apple to Google to Spotify to Stitcher and iHeartRadio, to name a few. And you can also email and write into us at YouTube and Facebook Live. We'd love to hear from you as well as gracehour.org. So as we begin the program, Pastor Jason, um, we've been thinking a lot about marriage this week. And the quintessential chapter in the New Testament on marriage has to be Ephesians chapter 5. And there's some meaty things inside that chapter that uh, I've been challenging for the Christian. Um, One of the ones that's always trumped out at every uh, marriage seminar or um, sermon on marriage, it'll always be this classic, husbands are to love their wives as Christ has loved the church. How do we do that? Because the first thing the husband says is, well, I'm not Christ and she's not the church. So the, they, they miss the application. Practically, how does that work out? Well, you told me to come up with eight different yes. ideas, and, and I kind of really enjoyed just this very practical idea of, of intimacy beyond the bedroom, as, as we could say. And uh, I think when you're having, uh, you know, loving your neighbor as yourself, you're mm-hmm. building equity in your spouse. I, I think of a few things very practically, like emptying the dishwasher. Hmm. That's a that's a kind of a, a practical way to say, hey, honey, I care about not only the food that you are cooking, but I'm also going to be a practical help uh, just to say I'm with you and I'm going to pick up the slack where I can. Taking out the trash, these are, again, maybe basic mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. building equity, kind of putting value into what, the, what your spouse is doing. Uh, taking out the trash seems very simple, like sure. little things, Pastor Ronaldo, right? Sure. Yeah, so, you, um, so you're saying chores. Yeah. So that's my or, takeaway. Yeah, chores, but really more than that, just ministry. The honey-do list is always mm-hmm. something that never ends. But but you're bringing value to right. what she is doing, and you're saying, listen, I see it, I care about you, right. and, and it's not it's not insignificant to me. Sure. You want to hear a couple more? Sure, keep firing away. Uh, picking up after yourself, right? That's fun. You now, 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 <laughs> now, here, now here's what the wives are going to say. The wives are going to say, "This is not you loving me as Christ. This is stuff you're supposed to be doing anyway." Sure, so, <laughs> but it's the basics. <laughs> yeah, okay. The guys miss the basics sometimes. Major in the minors. Okay, keep yeah. going. So you said pick up after yourself. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking of a story right time right now where I had a pastor who he got newly married, and his wife worked a different job, and he was um vocational, so he didn't work. She would leave in the morning, and when she would come back home, he wouldn't make the bed. Okay. It got so bad that she broke down crying like, I can't believe you can't do this simple thing like make the bed. Oh, wow. So he made an adjustment, and making the bed changed their marriage. Yeah. See? It's the little things that are huge. Uh, How about this? If you have kids, and I have an awesome nine-year-old, I mean, it's just sometimes it's like a hurricane going through the house, so... Just being there as a supporter, a supporting mm. role, kind of reinforcing uh, what she says mm-hmm. and reinforcing she reinforces what you say and making sure you're together and walking together agreed. I, I think that's a huge one. I think kids, mm-hmm. if they don't see a united front, they can manipulate their way through. So I think it's very edifying for the spouse to mm-hmm. 
hear the other one say, what did your mother say? What did your father say? And then actually affirm that and act and, and, and act upon that. So, so, so going back to that one, I like what you said there about support. Mm. Because sometimes one of the ways you express love is support. And let's, let's, re, let's reconfigure that. When Paul is saying, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself forward, he's not talking just a mindset. Because a mindset unexpressed is unknown. Mm. So he's talking about expression here. That's why you're hearing us today, folks, listing things that you can do. They're methods of expression. Because uh, I was talking to a couple, I was counseling a marriage couple about a month ago, and the woman told the husband, well, I, I love you. I'm here, aren't I? I? I wouldn't be here if I didn't love you. And I said to her, love is not a position. Love is an expression. And your, possession, your position doesn't always express how you feel. Mm -hmm. So just because you're present doesn't mean that you're expressive. I said, you got to get past the position and find out your position to express, but not that the possession, ex the position expresses that. And I think sometimes as husbands, also as wives, but since the verse is talking about husbands, as husbands, we lead in that expression of love. Mm. Yeah, we say, love me care for me. Maybe we don't use those words, but yeah. in our hearts, it's an expectation. But I think in Ephesians chapter five, we're going to read in a minute that uh, you are investing, mm -hmm. loving, caring, and the reciprocal action is the response. And yeah. so many are looking by doing to get a response, and that puts pressure, yeah. that puts an a unrealistic expectation maybe. But again, just just like you'd remodel a house, mm -hmm. let's say you remodel your bathroom or you remodel your kitchen, it adds value to your house. I think love is super practical. I think love is not a feeling, it's a choice. Mm -hmm. So again, majoring in the minors, I like how you said that, yeah. it's it's the little things, the accumulation of little things that is huge and makes big things, like washing the floor or... Um, you know, maybe just being present grocery shopping or, you know, again, these are very domestic things. Um, sure. but again, if you're, if your home is healthy, then you have, uh, the equity and the flexibility, uh, knowing that, Hey, your most important possession, if I could say is cared for, because isn't it true, Pastor Ronaldo, so many of us give our best at work and then we give 10% at home and that's why there's trouble, Right. But if we give our best at home and our best everywhere else, of course, but we take care of our home life first, then I tell you, it makes the rest of our life easier, I think. I would throw out also active listening. Okay. I think one of the expressions of love is listening. Um, Absolutely. People that listen to you, you tend to believe that they, at the very minimum, the floor is that they care about you. And beyond that is that they love you. And we often love people who listen to us. Um, we love grandma because grandma takes the time to hear what I have to say, you know, where parents may not do so. But you mentioned something to piggyback to on this expressing love, the way Christ is intimacy beyond the bedroom. I think Christ has an intimacy that he expresses towards the church, a personalness that should mimic in marriage because most of us, in intimacy, particularly in the Christian marriage, intimacy is a bedroom word. Mm -hmm. It's a bedroom word, it's a bedroom behavior. But there are many methods of practical expression um, that minister to our spouses in love that are considered intimacy. A hug, a, a proximity is important, being nearness, mm -hmm. a touch. Those things are expressing, I love you. Mm -hmm. And it may not always, we always think expressions of love is going to be an item or a word. When often it's a, it's a lifestyle and a mindset, but I, I think there's a lot to say here about that, about expressing love. I want to say it a different way, not loving my wife the way Christ loves the church, but expressing love with God's heart for her as Christ does towards the church. And then it lends itself to the sacrifice because who cares if we're strangers in the house and you sacrifice because then I'm sacrificing for a stranger. I'm doing, I, I, don't you see what I'm doing? I'm out here working, the lights are on because I'm here. Yeah, but those things don't say love to me. Paid mm -hmm. rent doesn't say love to me. A paid mortgage doesn't say love to me. It says cared for, 
but it doesn't say love to me. I mean, God, God, you could say God expresses to the church. Didn't I make the sun to rise? Didn't I give you breath and life? Come on, can't you say I love you? It wasn't enough. He got intimate. He came yes. towards us. John 1.14, he dwelt among us. Um, mm. Colossians 1.27, he lives in us. There's this intimacy in a very personal way. One of the things you get from God is the personalness of God, the mm. intimacy of God. And I think that's a, a, a shade or a degree of this verse that doesn't get brought out a lot. Let me ask you this question, because this is what comes up next. When a man reads this verse, and when you read Ephesians chapter 5, there's seven things that a man should do and three things that a woman should do. Mm. Now, a man reads it and says, <laughs> that's not fair. That's not equitable. And that, does she get to be lazy? So that begs the question, is marriage 50-50? Mm. Before I answer that, I mean, this is so good. I think there's an important s- statement you've said mm-hmm. with intimacy, look into me and see is one of these little play on words. Mm-hmm. It's this depth of the relationship. You have physical intimacy, you have emotional intimacy, you have recreational intimacy, you have social intimacy, you have intellectual intimacy, and there's one more, a spiritual intimacy, which is mm. the engine to all of them. Mm. So when you're engaging your spouse, like you said, active listening, I think sure. this is a huge key because you can just kind of placate and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you engage and you ask questions and you actually become interested, it sends the message that, hey, my husband or, or wife is actually interested, they care, and therefore engagement, like asking those what questions. Uh, and again, I don't mean to be mechanical here, but I think the little things are like huge. So when you're talking, is marriage 50-50? I would say no. It's not a partnership. It's a union. And what I mean by that is we give 100% of ourself. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Pastor Stevens has said a finished work relationship is really, uh, it's not two necessarily, but it's one giving 100% of themselves that they've received from God. It's mm-hmm. giving God to our wife in, in this particular case. So is it 50-50? Well, a lot of people think it is. Partnership, you know, you do this, you do that. This is your role. This is my role. But really, it's 100% of myself. Mm-hmm. And and that may look different in different um, in different relationships, but what is the need of my wife? That's the question. And mm-hmm. what is not only the physical need, what is the emotional need, spiritual need, intellectual need, recreational need? What is it that affirms her that I love her and that I care about her mm-hmm. and that she's the greatest thing in my life, mm-hmm. right? So these are big things. But that's that buzzword you mentioned. You hear a lot at all the marriage seminars is partnership. We're partners in this, right? And everyone knows there's no such thing as a 50-50. And I, I want to put this on the table. There's no relationship in all eternity that's 50-50. The only 50-50 relationship that exists is the Trinity, where each member of the relationship is giving the exact equal amount, which means in a relationship of any kind, including marriage, there are going to be situations and, 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 and areas that one spouse may give more than the other. Mm-hmm. But, that's not the, but, but sameness is not the measurement of equality. I'm going to say a few statements here. People do not have to be the same in order to be equal. Number one, that sounds simple, right? That's good. Because no two people are the same. So how, how can we all be? They may be equal in dignity, but they're not equal in, in identity as far as their individuality. But if we think a little deeper, does everybody have to have, to have the same abilities to be equal? <clears throat> Do they have to have the same opportunities to be equal? In our, in our country, we fight to make sure every citizen has the same opportunity. But the equality that you have as a citizen in this country is not based on the same opportunities. You just It's just not going to happen. Does everyone have to have the same role in order to be equal? Mm. Does everyone have to have the same function to be equal? Um, the culture says yes, but the Bible says no. Sameness is not a synonym for equality. They're not the same. Sameness does not mean equal. Because how can we achieve sameness? It's impossible to achieve sameness because that would be imitation. That mm. would be identical. God didn't make us identical. First Corinthians 12, 1 through 3 talks about the varieties in Christ. Variety does not remove equality. Oneness is not sameness. But so when you speak about equity and equality, you can't use the word sameness because none of us are the same. 
We have diversity in gender and roles and gifts and callings and ability. And in and, and different marriages, sometimes we say, well, you know, the man should do this specifically all the time. But maybe he doesn't. And the woman should do this. Maybe she doesn't. There's some things that don't change based on their function. And there's some things that are flexible. And as we grow forward in society and as a culture, some things have become more flexible than they were before. The Mm -hmm. idea of a man in the kitchen 80 (laughs) years ago would have been anathema. Some men have never even been in the kitchen. And I can name some men, I can name some men now who don't know where their kitchen is in their house. <laughs> There's such a thing as kitchen blindness. You open the fridge, honest to God, I'm I'm a res- Okay, first of where, all, you just Where's you, the milk? You, you just don't where's worry the me. You just don't kitchen blindness. I, I don't know if that's it's true. That's a thing. <laughs> is that a thing? It is. It's kitchen Honey, blindness. where is this and where is that? It's like right in front of you. Yeah. It's a thing. I was thinking of a, a, a guy I grew up with. His wife, his mother never learned how to drive. Everywhere she had to go, her husband had to take her. Mm. Everywhere, every place. It was, it was, it, it was, it, it, but now uh, you have women drive, they're all over the place. But in his generation, that would never, she never wanted it. He never offered it. They never thought about it. But mm. things have changed. But the, the distinctions and differences do not, are not made because of saneness. And I know a lot of my feminist groups want to make everything that a man can do, a yes. woman can do. Yes. I would say yes, but does she need to do it? Does she need to do it? It's not that whether she can, it's does she need to do it? Mm. Mm. Uh, it's like everything that a woman can do, a man could do, but does he need to do it? Mm. Is, number two, is there validation by doing it? Well, I'm a woman, now I'm doing what a man can do. Is there validation? Are you more of a woman because you do what men can do? The validation shouldn't be in what you do anyway. Because there's equal in value, but there's variance in function. Mm. So 50-50, no, that, that, those two things don't go together. Distinction should be welcomed and embraced is what I guess what I'm saying is. But no, uh, I'm not looking for 50-50 in any relationship. When Christ is initiating to the church and the marriage between the church and Jesus Christ in Romans 7, 1 through 8 and Ephesians chapter 5, 21 through 33, he's not saying the church is the same as him. The church is not the same as Jesus Christ. The church is connected to Jesus Christ, but they're not the same. So Mm. if we're to love our wives the way Christ loved the church, the goal is not sameness. The goal is oneness. And oneness is not always based on sameness. Yeah. You know? It's a beautiful word. I I think when I hear the word oneness, I think of wholeness. Mm, Great word. So again, it's like the whole man, the whole family. That's our our aspect of the church Mm -hmm. as far as ministry. We're not only reaching the whole man, Mm. we're reaching the whole family. So it's the same thing in marriage. And uh, it's, and it's, again, it's a journey because we learn to value Mm -hmm. what our spouse values. So we value the Bible. We value, um, we value church service. We value raising our son uh, with a biblical worldview. And instead of like attacking things that have no value, we support, strengthen, and invest in things that have value. So again, let's say the wife is excited about something, mm-hmm. we get excited about it. And genuinely, we learn how to engage, support. Well, that's a class, because if she's excited about canned goods at a, um, an Amish festival, I'm going to struggle with that, that <laughs> excitement. I'm going to struggle there. It's going to be hard. <laughs> really hard. With, with God can- will show you. <laughs> canned jams and old age cheese out on the corner of Pennsylvania, that's going to be hard. That's, well, that's, that's a cross. You know, honestly, Pastor, I mean, as pastors, maybe it could be said that including our wife in our ministry, making sure she has a place. We're going to get there. All don't, this Don't run like, too fast. I know. But just this valuing, like, hey, yeah. honey, you have a value that nobody else can bring to the table here. And then helping her understand that and vice versa. Yes, that, that's really true encouragement. And uh, so loving each other mm-hmm. is not just something that it's not just an action. It's an expression. I, I love what you said there. But I like the way you put it on preferring what the other person is and has in value instead of making it about my own value. Because when I look inwardly in a marriage, it becomes competition. Mm-hmm. Yes. And one of the things that happens particularly is, and our culture feeds it, it breeds this competition. You see it in our television, you see it in our movies where yes. um, uh, the one spouse makes fun of the other spouse, has fun of the other spouse, like, ah, your father always gets it wrong. Yeah, well, your mother never gets it right. It breeds this inner competition. Mm. 
So they and they're fighting for control. They're fighting for relevance. It's not mom and dad. It's mom over dad or, or dad over mom. It's like the oneness is who's the one, mm. as opposed to we're not the two shall not be one. Is who's the one today? Let's compete. And it, marriage should not be a competition. We have to learn how to, we sh- here's a good one. You share your successes, you share your rewards, but you also share the failure, the failures. Yes. Instead of, it's like sometimes you're like, we, we didn't, we, we kind of swung and missed it that one. I mean, you laugh about it, yes. but when, it, when you lead with, I can't believe you did that. So now you, in the marriage, you've made someone wrong and someone right. Mm-hmm. And so then that person defense mechanism has got to find a way to turn that back. They actually compete to see who can be right and who can be wrong. Mm-hmm. And that all comes from that 50-50 idea of I'm on top and you're on the bottom. And and I will get to this in a minute. But this idea of submitting, it's not a vertical conversation. It's a horizontal conversation. It's kind of mm-hmm. like when you're being led by the Spirit in Romans 8.14, Ephesians 5.18. The Holy Spirit is not over you when you are under him. The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the very prefix, the Greek prefix speaks of a horizontal movement. It's like I'm the Holy Spirit is beside me and draws near me and leads me. He leads from beside me, not above me. It's the same thing with a husband. He leads from beside his wife, not above his wife. And when you see it in this horizontal relationship as opposed to a vertical relationship, then I don't have to compete. Amen. I don't have to compete, but if it's if it's if it's like he's the king and I'm underneath, trust me, a coup is coming. <laughs> There's gonna be a revolution, <laughs> and oh. society will back it. Yeah. Great program today. We'd love to hear from you. One eight hundred three three eight seven zero six zero. Call us locally, please, at four one zero four eight three thirty seven hundred. I would love to hear how husbands, if how you have ministered the love of Christ to your wife. And women, maybe you can share a story is this weekend has got to be the um, the apex of, of, of husbands pursuing the idea of loving their wife with Valentine's Day around the corner. That's right. You, you kidding me? Husbands, florists are going to lose their minds selling flowers, but it's a great time seasonally to love on your wife, but you don't need a season for that. Every day is Valentine's Day when you have the love of God for your spouse. We'd love to hear from you. Write in also questions that um, questions at gracehour.org uh, the podcast you can write in YouTube and Facebook live we'd love to hear from you um, this is a great topic we have some great Christian marriages out there that are what I call hidden secrets no one knows about it share a story or Sarah Sarah, Sarah an idea where you've loved doing your spouse with the love of Christ we'd love to hear about it I want to ask you this other question while we're in Ephesians chapter 520 talking about loving your wife as Christ has loved the church Let's back up a little bit. Let's use a dirty word in marriage. Submit. Mm. <clears throat> it reads like this in Ephesians, and I'll read it verbatim. Um, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says in verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Okay. Christians have been hearing this forever. And in fact, this might be one of the top five verses that a Christian husband will say to his wife. He will quote it in part or in full. What does it mean for a woman to submit to her husband? Wow. <clears throat> I think the, the prefix of that verse is super important. Yes. Because if we're not submitted to God in the fear of the Lord, then I don't want anyone to submit to me, right? Yes, yes. Because they'll be submitting to my flesh. They'll be submitting to some rogue idea. But submission, I like how Elizabeth Elliot defined it. It's a glad surrender. It's submitting or coming under the authority of someone else's spirit. Yes. So the wife doesn't become the slave of the husband or the husband doesn't become a dictator that is commissioning his wife or has demands. But he's submitted to the Lord, has Mm -hmm. God's heart, God's mind, and now I'm not saying it's perfect. Like uh, I've got a great verse here in Romans 8 in a minute that really helps us with this. But submission is I come under the Christ in that other person. I come under that authority. I recognize the work of Christ in that other person, and I'm learning from it. So sure, there's preferences. Sure, there's needs. And sure, there is like expectations. And um, those are things that can be talked about and can certainly be um, you know, regulated in that sense, maybe practically or impact practically. But I think the front load of that verse is, am I 
as the husband submitted to God in honor, in respect to the Lord. Because if I'm not, I'm going to lead incorrectly, wrong direction. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to have the Spirit of God. I'm going to have my own spirit. My needs will drive me to what I expect. I'm looking for a response, mm -hmm. and therefore I'm applying pressure. And let's be honest, we manipulate our way. And uh, <clears throat> these things, we've seen the wrong response for submission, where you do what I say without any type of sharing or contributing or any type of input. <clears throat> and that destroys capacity, that destroys trust, and that destroys marriages, ultimately. Can I share this quick verse? It goes right along. Go. Romans 8, a uh, great chapter here, but I saw this verse. It helps us understand what we talked about previously. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants until we, until we pray for it. So we have weaknesses, mm -hmm. and we don't want to lead in our weakness. We don't want to lead in our insecurity. We want to— But uh, we do. We do. <laughs> But the more we're submitted to God, we say, okay, I'm confident in you, Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to let my passion drive me. I want the Spirit to move me, right? So in our weaknesses, God says, pray, and I will show you how to pray. Let's stay there for a second. If, if you, if you, you made a good point. You have to take these verses in context. 99% mm -hmm. um, of our hermeneutical errors with the Bible are based on context. Mm. You don't, the context, if you back up Ephesians chapter five, three verses, what does the verse say in verse 18? Be ye not drunk with wine to excess, but be ye filled of the spirit. It's very obvious in the connection there that it's, he's making a connection between being spirit filled, which leads you to verse 19, speaking to yourselves correctly, which leads you to giving thanks in verse 20 and leads you to submission Without the Holy Spirit, you won't submit properly. Mm. So he's speaking about first what you just said, submitting to God, then you can submit to someone else, and then a wife can submit to a husband. In the power of God, without the power of God, cultural submission never works. Um, uh, it, it does, it's not long-lasting. Um, uh, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, but I want to say more about this, but I want to take a quest couple questions that we have that are coming off the internet. Uh, the first one I have is, um, how do I lead in my marriage and minister the gospel to my wife who is an unbeliever and doesn't agree with my theology? Hmm. I would say this. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks about when you're married to an unbeliever. Um, you're not allowed, according to Paul, to divorce your spouse because they're an unbeliever, because that is the only ministry that, the, that God can have. The best opportunity, I would say, not the only, but the best opportunity that that spouse has is your ministry. Now, if they leave, Paul says, you don't have to pursue. But you, he's saying you, God, it's not God's will that you leave the marriage because of the office of marriage in Hebrews 13, verse 4, the marriage bed is undefiled. So you can't go. You stay. How do you lead in your marriage and minister the gospel? I would say by your life, number one. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, life speaks. I would also say this. Mm. I would also say that the same way that Christ... He loves the church, but he's ministered to the world. How did Christ minister to the world? He loved the world and gave himself for it. He didn't give himself for the church. He gave himself for the world. So he expressed his love that we can say God loves the world in John 3, 16, but he expressed his love to the world, unbelievers. He expressed the gospel to unbelievers because of the opportunity to respond. So how do you do that? I think you walk with God. Mm -hmm. I think you express the life of Christ. I think you live for God before her, and life speaks. Your walk with God can be very loud. Your faith can be very loud. In the house, in the marriage, your faith can be very loud. I remember... Uh, a story Dr. Stevens used to tell about a woman in his church whose husband was a fall-down drunk. And he used to, at times, was physical with her, would come home every night drunk, and she would quietly, when he would come in, in the morning, she would quietly make him breakfast, minister to him, take every time. And he asked her one time, why are you so kind to me? Why are you so nice? Because she said, this might be the only picture of God that you see. 
and I would say this to you, sir, you are probably the best picture of God to your wife that she will ever see. So how do you lead in your marriage? By walking with God. By walking with God. Never try to get sophisticated and strategic. You can just be spiritual and trust that your life with God speaks. Hopefully that helps you, Pastor Jason. I love what you're saying. I know that couple, those that couple actually become oh, wow. uh, deacons in the church eventually. It was an amazing story. Yes, saved. you know that story. Yeah, yes. it was way back in the yep. early days in Maine. But mm-hmm. I would say this too, like we can either try to change the situation or mm. we can let the situation change us. Mm. And I think the second one is really valuable because we're always, well, in our flesh, we want to change our spouse and Mm -hmm, these things. mm -hmm. And that just never works. It always backfires. But I want to highlight a verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, um, that really helps us understand this because uh, your spouse, if they're not saved, uh, you might be the only Jesus that they see. And therefore, uh, when we've seen this here in our church uh, with unequally yoked, it's just Maybe they got saved when they, uh, I'm sorry, they got married when they were unsaved, and one spouse gets saved, and now they're walking with God, and their life is what persuades yes. their other spouse to respond. And we've seen God rescue and save uh, the unbelieving spouse many times. But in three seven, it says, "In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives and treat them with understanding." I this big word is huge. This word is big to understand their capacity to understand where they're coming from. And I think prayer, and I stress that word strongly, that am I praying for my spouse? Hmm. Am I praying for their salvation? Am I praying um, to maximize every opportunity uh, so that they will see something different than the world? And I, I think we could glaze over that, Pastor, very easily. Sure. Not you, of course, but I'm just saying we could All say, <laughs> oh, I've prayed already. How much more do I have to pray? Well, yeah. pray without ceasing, because prayer is the only thing that changes bad habits, mm-hmm. bad um, bad upbringing. I think a lot of people bring baggage into the marriage, mm-hmm. and they don't realize it till way down the road mm-hmm. when things blow up in your face. Uh, so you, as the spiritual one in Galatians 6, 1, you are... Uh, Again, serving the other with meekness, lowliness in Ephesians 4, 3. Yes. Uh, your spirit is what's going to draw her, in this particular case, to something greater. And really, is there some? Is there a contrast? Do I look so much like the world that my Christianity is weak? Or really, is my Christianity something that is a direct contrast that's attractive? Yes. Is my faith attractive to my spouse that they would want more? Or am I just a Bible-thumping uh, you know, legalistic person that that is just commanding rather than, like you said, living it out loud. I think living out loud is so much more valuable than commanding uh, people to to comply, right? Comply. <coughs> but instead, it's like, no, no, I'm learning. I'm not perfect. I, I make mistakes. In my weaknesses, the Spirit speaks. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's also pray, actually, pray for her salvation. It's actually easier, too. Uh, my friend who wrote that question, I said that to you because I, I gave you something that you can actually do. Mm-hmm. I didn't give you a list of things to do. Um, try this, try that, try this. Um, I, I want you to understand that God's strategy for living is living with God. I Excellent. want you to see that. It, there's not some 16 ways to make my spouse more spiritual. Um 37 ways to get her to quote scripture. And you see husbands <laughs> sometimes, they're like, they, they think that lead means to drag, you know? And uh, you just do like the butcher with sheep, just drag it. I'm dragged to the church. Well, no, minister, minister. Never underestimate the power of ministry and mm. your testimony. Um, because you, you can't sit there and uh, apply things differently with her than you do with other people. And sometimes we have a tendency to be familiar with our ministry to our spouse. I want to go back to that word submission for a second here. Um, Understand what this word is. The majority of the time in the New Testament, the word used for submit, and it's the same word for be subject to in verse 21, and the same word for be. So in other words, it's the same type of submission. One to another and wife to husband. It's a voluntary word. The majority of the time in the New Testament is a voluntary word. It is, and it was, the way it's been presented in that verse is in the middle voice, is that you voluntarily submit yourself to the will of another and you benefit from the submission. 
there is a spiritual benefit. You may not get a personal benefit. When a wife submits to a husband, there may be no personal benefit, but there is a spiritual benefit in the marital relationship. Um, it's not a manipulated submission. It's not a mandatory submission. It's a voluntarily submission. Um, when the church submits to Jesus Christ, it is a voluntary submission. The same as when a wife submits to a husband. It's a voluntary submission. And furthermore, when the church submits to Jesus Christ, there's a benefit for her. When a wife submits to a husband, there's a benefit for her. So it's exactly what Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter 5. It's a, it's a continued thought. Um, and I like the way one author put it, that spirit-filled believers voluntarily place themselves in the position of submission because of the will of God, not the will of man. A wife does not submit to a husband because he's a good husband. It doesn't say, wives, submit yourself to a good husband. Wives, <laughs> submit yourselves to an honest husband. Wives, submit yourselves to the top 10 husbands in the church. No, submit yourself to, it says it very clearly, to your own husband. And I think of Abigail and Nabal. Nabal, she said, she said you know, I know my husband's a fool. I get it. She didn't even make excuses and lies. Say, you know, Nabal is an amazing guy. She's like, no, he's not so amazing, but he's my husband. So I'm going to submit to that. I'm going to cover that. And I'm going to stand with him in the face of his life being taken because he's my husband. And it's as unto the Lord. It's as unto the Lord. Uh, and the word there is interesting. The word there for wives, it's not special. It speaks about... Equality, it's a, it's, a, it's a word, gune is the word, it's the word that speaks of equal value. It's not, there's a different word that Paul could have used if he wanted to say a woman of lesser value than a man. But it's speaking about a woman who's on equal footing with a man. So when you submit, you don't lose your value. When mm. you submit, you don't lose your position. It actually comes like this. It's one person submitting to another person with equal value. But in God's order, she submits under her husband to support the order of God. God, not to in encourage the authority of a man. Make that. Um, that's the important thing. Don't let submission be a dirty word in your marriage or a dirty word in your mind about your relationship with your husband. And husbands don't think that that's a license to do whatever you want to because, frankly, biblical submission is only possible when you are filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to Amen. say that. I yes. cannot say that loudly yes. enough. You can't apply the Bible without the Spirit. So when the Bible says, wives, submit yourselves to your husband, you need the Holy Spirit. If there's no Ephesians 5.18, there'll be no Ephesians 5.21 and 22. You won't submit yourselves to each other, or if you do, it'll be a cultural submission and not a spiritual submission. And at the end of that verse, I love what Paul puts there. It's what I call a protective clause. It says, as unto the Lord. Mm, yes. The order of submission is critical. A wife submits to Christ her Lord, and then she's motivated by the Spirit to submit to the headship of her husband. Okay? The headship. It protects her submission. So when things go sideways, I'm saying, okay, I'm not submitting to him just because he's a nice guy and he's handsome. No, it has nothing to do with his appearance. It's as to the headship of the position that he has within the, and I want to say this right here, within the bounds of the will of God. Within the bounds of the will of God. As unto the Lord. That's what that means. Let me give you some examples, and maybe you can name a few, some examples of when a wife should, ch should ch ch check her submission. Um, uh, when it means to bury her spiritual gifts. Mm. I don't think it's the will of God that she buries her spiritual gifts. I believe there's a time and place. But to say she has no gifts is to remove what God has given her. God didn't give her gifts so that when she's married, they go put, put in a drawer. Right, right. Number one. I would say in everything does not mean submission to sin. Mm -hmm. If your husband is leading you into public or private sin that you know is sin, you may not be led. You have to hear from the Holy Spirit, but God's not leading you in that submission. That's why it's key the Holy Spirit leads you. Um, it does not mean yielding to criminal behavior or threats or physical abuse. I'm your husband, so yield to me in physical or, or threats or abuse. Those are not what that verse is talking about. That's, this is not a credit card to turn your wife into a slave or an indentured <laughs> servant. It's not how it works. It's as unto the Lord. But I want to also say this. 
Submission doesn't mean that, okay, I'm submitting, but I'm going to subvert his will and I'm going to use deception and manipulation and whining to get to, oh yeah, I'm submitting, but I'm not really submitting. I'm working against you behind it. You might be the head, but I'm the neck that moves the head and I'm going to use that to control you. It's not also woman a reason to bring about a separate attitude. Let me, let me comment on that because you, you hit something there big. Like, I, don't you think in some cases with submission, it's a real trust issue? Because mm-hmm. they may submit outwardly, but in their heart, they're a bucking bronco. They're just like yes. fighting it and they'll subvert and try to work the angles. Yeah. But I think when, uh, when someone, well, like, let's say in this case, your spouse is willing to say, I don't know all the answers, I don't know, I don't understand what's going on, but I trust the Christ in you. Therefore, I'm going to, I use that word trust, to put my faith in God for you, even though I don't understand everything. So, because there is, there are men that are um, restrained from the will of God because the wife doesn't trust, wow. and vice versa. I don't want to yeah. make this a, I don't want to bash wives here, because, um, and I, I want to say this up front, like encouragement for the husband is critically valuable it builds equity and builds confidence and such and so forth. But, but submission, when I can trust the Christ in my spouse, like I know in our marriage, we've been married 26 years, and my wife doesn't just talk fervorously. She says things, and I know that they're from God because she doesn't just, just say blow smoke. So I've learned to trust, and the Spirit confirms that, and vice versa, she's learned to trust me. And we pray, and we pray. Um, fleece or, or um, prove all things. But like you said, it, it's not illegal activity, of course. Like, if you love me, you do this, and it's this whole thing. But it's trust. And, and let's be straight up honest. People have lost trust in relationship, maybe in blended families or maybe a bad authority growing up as a as their father or mother was imbalanced in some way. So building trust means I'm trusting the character and nature of Christ in my spouse and I'm therefore agreeing with Christ, and I'm following by faith in some cases. But I was going to say this. That's huge. Let's be very clear. <laughs> Ephesians 5.21 is a faith statement. Mm-hmm. Ephesians 5.22 is a faith statement. Ephesians 5.18 is a faith statement. That your spirit filled requires faith. That you would submit one to another requires faith. That a wife would submit to a husband requires faith. So you're not just going to submit and instantly everything works. Right. My question is, can you submit when things are not right? Can you submit when your covering gets it wrong? I mean, you can say that about a pastor or any spiritual covering in your life. Can you submit beyond your agreement? In fact, that's the test of submission. Can you submit when you have a difference in opinion? There you go. And I think think men have to leave space where their wife can have input and have their liberty and approachability that they can have input. And I can take the input, but as the head, I can still make decisions for the family. And in some cases, you may yield uh, decisions. Absolutely. You don't have to make every decision. I mean, there's, and she may be, it could be like with Moses' wife. One time, she, God didn't, Moses didn't listen. Another time, God's like, listen to your wife. Same thing with Abraham. Uh, one time, listen. One time, didn't. Okay, do it. David don't, and Abigail, yes. same thing. So it's like... Wow. To be, again, we've let the world shape our minds about this word submission. And submission is not a bad word. It's a safe word. When I'm led by God by faith, it's a safe word. Pastor Ronaldo, let's say our wives disagree with us. Is Are we going to go on the defensive and become passive aggressive and like come down hard? Or are we going to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to check my heart before mm-hmm. you. And if it's something that you've persuaded me, then therefore... We can go back in gentleness and kindness and be firm, gentle but firm. And because I think our our wives really just want to know, did you really hear from God? Did is this really from God? And I think disagreement kind of checks our heart, kind of checks the system, and we say, Yes, I did, or no, let's pray longer on this. I think some guys get wigged out with well, they want the wallflower, they want the yes. seen and not heard kind of I, I, I love the, the passionate pushback because it, it checks me because, you know. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll, I'll just say this. Any leader, and we're not just talking about a husband with a wife, but any leader that can't, can't receive in, input doesn't lead well. Mm. You won't lead because you're, you're left to the counsel of yourself. It's true. Some of the greatest ideas come from input. Some of the decisions you might make as a husband, well, you know, I, I want to say this too. 
when there's input and it's right, recognize it. Because more often than not, when it's the wrong input, you recognize that. So all you're doing is recognizing when input is there and it's wrong, you build a capacity that they can never give you any input that's right. Mm. So you've got to build space that, yeah, that they can be right. That, that, that Again, we're equally valued. We just have different functions. And in some areas, you may find out that you're submitting. That's why I like it says submitting yourselves one to another. Yes. Before it says wives submit to your husbands. And when you say this too, like sometimes that pushback could be very different from actually what's going on now. This could be a, a, mm. a, a specific need. Maybe there needs to be more attention or cherishing or listening. Mm. It has nothing to do with what's going on at present. So again, discerning uh, what's really going on. And that's why without prayer, we're blind as a bat. And um, we, we really need our spiritual senses to be in tune to our spouse. Uh, looking at, we have a bunch of questions on the internet. I'll I'll try to grab one or two here. Um, why do preachers why preachers don't teach on Sundays about the position of God about divorce? I think if you listened to Grace Hour yesterday, you, you heard Pastor Schauer speak specifically about that theme. So Ruth, I would ask you to go on the archive and pull up yesterday's Grace Hour. It will really help you. Some mm-hmm. great stuff there. And I'll say a lot of preachers don't touch on that because there's a lot, I, Ruth, to be honest with you, there's about 14 subjects that most preachers are not going to touch because they want to keep the offering plates full. <laughs> so I would say uh, we did talk about it on Grace Hour yesterday. We're not scared to talk about it. Go check it out tomorrow, um, last night, yesterday's program, and I think you'll get some answers there. Um, Oretta says, Amen. The wife compliments her husband in the fear of the Lord. Yes, I like the word Oretta used there compliments, not, con- not controlled by her husband. Um, or condemns. Yeah. Another one, what is mm. the future for the one who left spouse and sons and daughters? Um, Ruth, I'd have to know how and why they left. It just says left the spouse. What could be the reasons behind that? Um, again, Ruth, I would refer you back to yesterday's program about spiritual separation and divorce. Uh, once again, Ruth, you talk about, can you give some examples of the consequences of the spouse who commits adultery and divorces his wife, please? Um, well, there's definitely consequences for adultery as far as sin, as far as divorcing his wife. Um, again, I'm going to refer you back yesterday. I want to be repetitive and overspeak where Pastor Schaller's already spoke. Mm. Grace Sour yesterday, Thursday yesterday, Thursday afternoon's program. Ruth, go check it out. Um, Sean, we already answered your question. Uh, and it seems like the king of spicy, you've asked the same question. And I would say this, um, what I said earlier is true. And king of spicy, you said I've tried a lot. I want to say this to you right now. You can't outlove God. You can't outlast God. And there are men that have in your situation that have been there for 20 and 30 and longer than that years. But the thing is this, if you really love your wife and you really want her to have God, you will spend and be spent and you will take as whatever it takes is what it takes. If it's 21 years, then it's 21 years. If it's 27 years, then it's 27 years. Uh, I would say just keep going. Continue in the things you've learned, knowing what you received in 2 Timothy 3, 14. Madeline Johnson talks about kitchen blindness is a thing. Oh my gosh. Yes, it's it is. It's true. Yeah. You know, Pastor Ronaldo, real quick, I just think sometimes what can creep in the heart of, of someone that's in a constant chronic uh, pressure is that, oh, uh, you know, there's something better over here. Sure. Or I'll just end this and start. Again, God it becomes the will of God with, with that commitment. And I would just say for those that are unequally yoked or those that are in bad marriages or chronic problems, it's like you are getting, you're getting with God. You know, we understand that divorce happens because of adultery, abandonment, or abuse, but really God's heart is that he hates divorce. So we are the one that is going deep with God. We're going deep into the love of God, deep into the grace of God, deep into the mercy of God. That's below, really, the problem at hand. Because if we're being conformed to the image of God, then this problem or issue or this person is going to refine us into the glory of God. You know, it, it's Amen. very, very important. Amen. I and marriage want, is not easy. Well, I, no, marriage is, I mean. Marriage, marriage is an institution of God, which means is. men don't create it, men don't maintain it, men don't give it, men don't really build it, but we are built by it. It's an instrument go. of God to build us. I want to close with this one thought. Okay, uh, as I'm married and I, want, and I want to serve God together, what exactly does that mean and what exactly does that look like? Mm. Serving God together as a married couple. Give me your thoughts. Yeah. I would say one of the most important things to do, let's say you have something in your heart burning, invest that vision in your spouse. 
pray with your spouse because okay go slow so you said invest the vision. share the vision with your wife yeah because okay. she's not going to be your assistant pastor she's hopefully not going to be your secretary or administrative assistant okay. but again she's she, maybe behind the scenes sharing and supporting your ministry with prayer love and domestic care but again uh how do you serve god together again mm. it doesn't have to necessarily be she's standing right next to you even sure. though that is a beautiful thing but she's with you, walking together in Amos 3.3, agreed with what God's put in your heart. And I think as, as men, we have to invest that. We have to talk about it. We have to include and just say, honey, this is what God's put in my heart. Mm. Let's seek God together. Like, Let's pray together. Like leading in that. Yes. I, I like the words you said there, sharing your vision. I think... Men have to initiate spirituality. It could be something as simple as praying before her. And you say, well, she won't pray with me. Pray before her. There you go. Pray in her presence. And maybe she's just there. Or invite her to pray with. It could be brief. Um, initiate spiritual things. Um, share testimonies about what's happening and what you're into. Because by the thing is this. Half the things you do, she doesn't even want to do. Mm -hmm. She just wants to be included in what you do. Exactly. And when you include her in what you do, she doesn't have to do what you do, but she's with you. Exactly. So it's, it's got to be that. It's the with principle. The best way you show someone value is to include them. So I would say, um, how do we serve God as a married couple together? Inclusion. Um, and that may not necessarily mean occupying the same space. But it means that there is a concerted effort to involve my spouse in my And this goes the opposite way. If you're a wife and you're involved in ministry and a lot of different things, and maybe your husband is not as involved. Maybe you're involved. Maybe you work for the church. You're involved in 14 different things in the church. And maybe your husband, he works a regular job in the secular world. And he's not as involved. I have to be creative in how I involve my husband in the things that I do so that yes. he knows that, okay, I didn't just give my wife to the church. Meanwhile, I'm working across the street, you know, breaking <laughs> cement. Arr! No, but I involve him in too. You know, I'm married and we're involved in what it is. And it may not be a couple's Bible study. Well, you know, we might not be doing a family roundtable every month. But it can be, we're in this thing together. We're in this, they, they need to know that we are, we are walking with God and serving God together. I, I think of the couple of Aquila and Priscilla as we close. In Acts 18.2, 18, we're introduced to them. And every time that they're, you hear about them in the scriptures, Acts 18.3, Acts 18.8, Acts 18.26, Romans 16.3, 1 Corinthians 16.19, 2 Timothy 4.19, you hear them together. Yes. You don't hear Aquila without a Priscilla in the Bible. Once they're introduced, it's because they're in this thing together. And I think when you do that, you sp it speaks volumes to the body of Christ. It speaks volumes to other missionaries. And it really ministers to your own spouse, whether you're a woman who includes your husband or a husband who includes his wife. In both cases, it's not just one side. I think because of the uniqueness and variety in the body of Christ, you have some wives that are very, very active and their husbands yes. tend to be invisible. Yes. She's, oh, he's okay. They'll involve him creatively in whatever it is or talk about or connect. Yeah. If we connect in what we do with God, yes. we find God together. Listen, balance, right? Yes. Balance. If I'm running over my husband because I'm so passionate about something and, and he, or, or vice versa, it's like we have to slow it down. We have sure. to love them first. I, I think the balance is we love our spouse first. That's we honor word. our spouse first, even before we get active, because if we forget and neglect our family, then we may lose our family. And that would be a tragedy of, of great proportions. We would lose our ministry if we would lose our family. So loving and having great balance. I love that word, balance, yeah. balance. And I want to say this. Because um, <laughs> we can be in balance very easy. Yeah, I want to say this as we close. We're not on the show today to um, promote the perfection of marriage. Mm. Um, what I want to say is there are a lot of marriages that are, are, are suffering. Yes. A lot of folks have been hurt in marriage, and we're not glossing over that but we're presenting the standard that God has for marriage. Um, if there isn't a standard presented, then you have nothing to look to. Um, I do know that a lot of marriages don't fit in the categories that we're discussing. A lot of husbands don't respond the way we're talking. A lot of wives don't respond the way we're talking. Don't lose hope. Um, mm -hmm. the, today's program is not designed to fix your marriage. 
Um, today's program is not designed to be your marriage counselor, but it's to give you God's mind about marriage. Because if you don't know God's mind about marriage, you'll believe somebody else's. So if you're out there and you're married and you're Christians and you're, and you're, you're being challenged in your marriage, don't give up hope. God mm. cares more about your marriage than you do. Amen. So thank you so much for joining us today on Great Tower. Um, don't forget to subscribe to YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. You can pull these down all the time and look at them. Join us next week on Monday for another exciting week on the Great Hour. God bless you.